Today we're out here taking a look at the 2019 Nissan Armada, the second generation of Nissan's full-size SUV in America. The Armada, especially now that we are talking about the second generation Armada, does require a little bit of explanation. Back in 2004, Nissan decided that they wanted a full-size body-on-frame SUV to compete with the Yukon, the Tahoe, etc. So they took the North American Titan and created the North American Armada, not the model that we're seeing right here. It was actually very, very different. What was odd about that was that Nissan already had a very durable large SUV in other world markets called the Nissan Patrol. And that Nissan Patrol has existed for longer than the Armada has in North America. 2017 rolled around and they realized that the Armada was getting pretty old. So what they did was they took the Nissan Patrol, they slapped a Nissan Armada front end look on it, and then called it the Armada in North America. But at that point, the basics of this vehicle were already seven years old, but it was definitely new to America and newer than the old Old Armada, which started back in 2004. If you're not confused yet, there is yet another twist, and that is that back in 2010, the Patrol was actually brought to America as the Infiniti QX56, now called the Infiniti QX80, and we recently had a review on that model. The QX56 and the QX80 were, interestingly enough, not based on that original Armada, but actually based on the Patrol that this is now based on as well. So with all of that out of the way, let's dive into the Armada and talk about how this stacks up with the rest of the full-size SUV competition in America. With a low base price, this is definitely one of the value forward entries if you're shopping for something that's a little bit bigger than a Pathfinder and definitely has more towing capacity than any of those other crossovers out there. If you live outside the United States, you probably think of the Nissan Patrol as a direct competitor to the Toyota Land Cruiser because it definitely has that off-road reputation worldwide. But in the United States, Nissan decided to go in a slightly different direction with this, and they've instead decided to target this at the Toyota Sequoia. So they've removed some of the off-road bits that we do find on the Patrol in other world markets, and they've also priced this more like a Toyota Sequoia than the Toyota Land Cruiser. So in kind of an interesting twist, you can see this as sort of the Toyota Land Cruiser and Lexus LX corollaries between this and the Infiniti, but also toss in the Toyota Sequoia in there as well. For North America, they've decided to give this a slightly different front end look than we see on the Patrol Worldwide. So this looks a little bit more like our Nissan Titan. We have these strong chrome bars here, big Nissan logo up front, optional 360 degree camera, LED low beam headlamps on these big headlamp modules. And most importantly, we don't see the refreshed front bumper that we see in the Nissan Patrol in other markets like the UAE. At 208.9 inches long, the Armada is a little bit longer than the Patrol, mainly because of the bumpers that had to change for the North American market, both up front and in the back, as we'll look at in a bit. The Patrol is a very direct competitor to the Chevy Tahoe, but this actually ends up a little bit longer than the Tahoe and the Yukon because of those changes for the American market. This is a little bit shorter than the Ford Expedition, however, even though overall interior legroom is pretty average for this segment. The biggest impact of adapting the Patrol to the North American market is found right here with this absolutely enormous bumper that sticks out from the back. It's definitely obvious that this is related to the QX80 on the outside. We have that same sticky out bumper we saw just a moment ago and then a very similar shape overall to the rear hatch. So definitely a lot of different shapes going on back here. Let me know what you think about the overall look down there in the comment section below. I have to say that overall I've never quite appreciated this rear end look on the Armada, although I definitely think the front end is fine. If I were to choose, I would actually say that the Infiniti is the more attractive model here. When it comes to active safety, most of Nissan's systems are found on the Armada, and features like auto braking, collision warning, adaptive cruise control are standard on all trims, which makes this a pretty good value compared to some of those other alternatives. You won't find those safety systems standard on vehicles like the Tahoe or the Expedition or the Yukon, but you will find them on the Toyota Sequoia. It is worth noting, however, that although they're not available on an entry like the Durango, at this price point, you will definitely find those features on there. Under the hood, we find the same 5.6 liter V8 engine that we find in the Infiniti QX80, but it produces a little bit less horsepower and a little bit less torque in the Armada. 390 horsepower and 395 pound-feet. The big difference between this and the engine in the Infiniti is that this was tuned for regular unleaded and the Infiniti's engine was tuned for premium unleaded. But interestingly enough, our 0 to 60 times and 0 to 30 times were absolutely identical between this and the top-end version of the QX80 we last tested. The only transmission on offer is a 7-speed automatic sending power to the rear wheels by default. 4-wheel drive is a $3,000 option because that 4-wheel drive system does come standard with the 2-speed transfer case. 
This engine is a little bit more powerful than the base engine we find in the Chevy Tahoe, but it does come in a little bit behind the Ford Expedition's 3.5 liter twin turbo, the Tahoe's optional 6.2 liter V8, and something like a Dodge Durango SRT, which I suppose you could compare to something like the Armada. When it comes to front seat comfort, I'm going to give these seats 9 out of 10 points. Oddly, I found these a little bit less comfortable than the ones in the QX80, even though theoretically the seat design is identical. I think it has to do with the overall leather that is wrapping these seats, makes them feel a little bit less cushy. The driver's seat has a two-way adjustable lumbar support, and we have a relatively similar range of motion over there on the passenger side. We have a powered tilt telescopic steering column in this trim, and two-position memory over there on the door. Hopping into the back seats, I'm going to give these optional captain's chairs 9 out of 10 points. I do find the bench seat just a little bit less comfortable. Overall, rear seat comfort is definitely better than the Sequoia, and I think better than the Tahoe as well. But the Expedition, I think, is a little bit more comfortable. It's also a little bit newer. The Armada is available as either a 7-passenger or an 8-passenger vehicle. The model that we're driving right now is the 7-passenger version, so we have this large fixed center console here. The downside to this is that it does not come out, so you can't use this as a way to get back there into the rear seats, but the upside is that we have a lot of permanent storage here. You can easily fit a gallon of milk inside this cubby right there, and then there's actually an additional storage cubby right down here. You can put large items like two liter bottles right in that, and then there's some cup holders on top. One downside worth mentioning is that the second row seats do not slide in this model and they only tilt in this fashion to help you get into the rear. Because of the way these second row seats move, both in this captain's chair version and in the eight passenger version, you cannot keep a child seat latched into place and still get into the third row. And that is a very handy feature that we see in the Pathfinder. So if you're debating between the Pathfinder and the Armada for a large family, if you have kids in child seats, definitely keep that in mind. Hopping into the third row, we actually find less combined legroom in the Armada than we find in Nissan's Pathfinder. And that is obvious when you take a look at the overall seating positions in the front, second row, and of course this third row back here. I have about two inches of legroom left, so overall legroom is not too much of a problem, but you can see that the seat bottom cushion is really slammed all the way to the floor. So this third row is not going to be terribly comfortable for larger adults. We do, however, have a power recline mechanism back here, which is kind of an interesting touch. We have a more reclined position right there. You can see this other seat is in it, and then we can actually recline it for a little bit of additional comfort. We also have some air vents back here, large number of air vents actually in the rear, two large cup holders on each side, but the floor in this is actually kind of oddly shaped, so my right leg actually ends up a little bit higher off the ground than my left. Behind the power lift gate, we find 16.5 cubic feet of storage space, which is about the same kind of storage space that we find in the Nissan Pathfinder. That puts this a little bit ahead of the current generation Tahoe at 15.3, but below the Ford Expedition, the Suburban, and the Sequoia as well. The cargo area is definitely wider than most of the three-row crossovers in America, but you won't really be able to fit that many more of those large roller bags back here. The overall roller bag score is actually the same as the Nissan Pathfinder. Towing is one of the big reasons that you might want to move from a three-row crossover into a large SUV like the Armada. The Armada will tow 8,500 pounds in base form, whether you get the two-wheel drive or the four-wheel drive models. That's 2,500 pounds more than the Nissan Pathfinder. That also puts this really at the top of the segment when it comes to base towing capacity. The Toyota Sequoia is rated for about 1,000 to 1,500 pounds less than the Armada, depending on how you have it configured. A Chevy Tahoe with the 5.3 liter V8 is rated only for a maximum of 6,600 pounds of towing. That is if you get the two-wheel drive version. Now, if you get the 6.2 liter engine in that Tahoe, then you can get it up to just 100 pounds over the Armada, but that's going to be more expensive than the base version of this Nissan. Same thing happens with the Ford Expedition. It'll tow right around 6,500 pounds in base form, and it'll go up to 9,300 pounds maximum, but you do have to choose an option package that's gonna make it more expensive than the Armada. The only entry in this segment that will tow about the same kind of weight that we find in the Armada for a similar price tag is actually the Dodge Durango. It'll tow 6,200 pounds with the V6, 8,700 pounds with the 6.4 liter V8, and 7,500 pounds if you get the 5.7 liter V8. Moving on to the inside, we find a pretty standard sized moonroof just over the driver and front passenger's heads. The front seats have these oversized headrests because there is a screen in the back. We have high adjustable shoulder belts, not just for the driver and front passenger, but also for the second row passengers as well. If I move back there, you can see those height adjustment mechanisms right there on the C-pillar. Since we're driving the top end trim, we have Platinum Reserve embossed on the seat backs, both for the second row seats as well as the driver and front passenger seats. 
There are a few different leather textures going on. You can see that we have a heavily grained side bolster for the seat back and seat bottom cushion. We also have perforations in the center of the seat back and bottom cushion because these seats are both heated and ventilated. Moving over to the front doors, we find more soft touch plastics than we find in the Nissan Pathfinder. We have a very squishy armrest right there in the middle, some puckered leather trim over there on the doors. And then if we zoom in on these panels, you'll notice one of the big differences between this and the Infiniti QX80. All of the shapes are very similar. We don't have real wood trim inside this cabin. This is actually imitation wood trim on the dashboard and on the doors. Moving over to the dashboard, we again find more soft touch materials than we find in the Nissan Pathfinder. The upper section of the dashboard is a soft touch material, and then we have some stitched sections that work all the way down from the top of that dashboard down here to soft areas where you can uh, rest your leg against the console and then wrap all the way down there towards the floor. This is essentially the same software that we see in some Infiniti models. It's very closely related to what we see in the Infiniti Q50, only it's been adapted for a single screen. We have our first button bank right here. This is where we find some direct access buttons to audio screens, the 360 degree camera system, navigation, integrated apps, the climate control, etc. You can interact with the system by either touching the screen or using this control knob right here. It moves around side to side, up and down, scrolls around and clicks down to enter. Below that, we find the power and volume control, some other direct access buttons, radio, media, disc, etc. Optical disc player right down there. The controls for the three zone automatic climate control system. We have two zones up front, driver and passenger, and then a third zone in the rear. You'll then find the controls for the heated and ventilated seats at the bottom of that stack. Two USB inputs that integrate with that infotainment system, but nowhere really to put your smartphone. There's no smartphone charging mat here or anything. We have a pretty typical console shifter. Shifter design is very similar to a lot of Infiniti models. Drive all the way down there, manual mode over to the left, push away from the driver for up, pull towards the driver for down. We then have this large area over here where we have two cup holders and then a square holder right up front. I suppose you could put your smartphone in there. A nice touch with this slot I have noticed is that you can put some things sideways right in that area, smaller smartphones, if you pass by your mailbox, you can also stuff letters in there, that sort of thing. We then have the controls for the four-wheel drive system behind the shifter, auto, four high, and four low. There's no rear-wheel drive mode like we find in some of the competition. I actually find that a nice touch because the engagement of the four-wheel drive system is actually very smooth in this vehicle. We have a snow button, tow mode button, and then a button to disable the traction control system. You'll notice that we don't have any terrain management options like we find in some of the newer options. And then behind that, we have one small square storage cubby. Just in case you forget what you're driving between the time you see your seats in the center console, we have Platinum Reserve embossed there again. This is really thickly padded, so it is quite comfortable. Under that lid, we find a large and deep center console storage area. You could easily fit a gallon of milk in there. Moving over to the instrument cluster, we have a six dial layout, which is a little bit more common in large SUVs like this. We have an engine oil pressure gauge over here on the right, and then a voltage gauge right over here on the left. Unlike most of the competition, however, we still have a small monochromatic display right here in the middle. It's controlled via the buttons that you can just barely see over on the right side of your screen. We press these to cycle through the various trip computer readouts. You don't get too many different functions on this display as we see in some of the more modern units. The steering wheel is a round four spoke design. We have some sport grips up top. The buttons for the adaptive cruise control system are over here on the right, along with a button to turn on and off some of the active safety systems. Over here on the left, we find the controls for the infotainment system, a phone button and a voice command button. And then this toggle right here does double duty as track up and down and a method of controlling that infotainment screen in the center of the dashboard. So if you don't want to touch it and you don't want to use that wheel controller we saw earlier, you can actually use this toggle right here as well. Even though this engine theoretically produces a little less power and a little bit less torque than it does in the Infiniti QX80, we actually ran from 0 to 60 in the exact same 6.3 seconds, and the 0 to 30 time was essentially the same as well. That makes this one of the faster entries available in this segment, and definitely one of the fastest in terms of base models. You can go a little bit faster than this in the Tahoe, but you would have to opt for that 6.2 liter V8 engine, which is going to be more expensive than the base model of the Armada. This is also a little bit faster than the Durango with the 5.7 liter V8, which comes in at 6.7 seconds, 0 to 60, and just a hair faster than the Sequoia at 6.6 seconds. In our 60 to 0 braking test, this model performed very well thanks to the wide tires that we find on all models. This stopped from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 127 feet, basically the same as the QX80 as well. This is also within one or two feet of the Expedition, the Tahoe, the Durango, etc. 
When it comes to the overall handling score, I'm going to have to drop this down to a B. If you're debating between this and the QX80, you should know that the QX80 feels a little bit more polished on-road and off-road thanks to its available hydraulic suspension system. Versus the Chevy Tahoe, I think that this is not quite as well sorted. We definitely get a little bit more body roll, it feels a little bit more ponderous, and a little bit heavier as well. Even though the Tahoe and the Yukon are about to get replaced, they're actually not as old as the bones of the Armada, and that overall level of polish and refinement definitely shows in the GM triplets. For some reason, the Armada in North America does not get the hydraulic body motion control system that we find in the Infiniti QX80 or in other world market versions of the Patrol. That system is a little bit similar to the Toyota KDSS system. It uses hydraulic reservoirs linked in a cross fashion in the vehicle to help not only smooth out the ride, but also improve on-road performance and off-road performance as well. In the Patrol and in the QX80, that system completely replaces the roll bars, but in the Armada, we actually get a more traditional suspension setup. And you will notice the difference between this and the QX80 out on a rougher road like this. The QX80 just glides over the smaller imperfections out on the road, more seamlessly than the Armada does. But this still has a relatively comfortable suspension as far as three row vehicles go. So this is definitely going to be more comfortable than some of those more performance focused three row crossovers. The overall isolation is also going to be very high in the Armada compared to your average unibody crossover. In our cabin noise test at 50 miles an hour, we got 69 decibels in here, which again makes this basically the same as the QX80. It's interesting that Nissan didn't really change too much in terms of the overall interior components and sound deadening components between this and the Infiniti model. The Nissan really seems to be benefiting from everything that they did in order to turn the Patrol into the QX80. As I've said before with body on frame SUVs, one thing you'll really notice when it comes to cabin quietness is how this sounds out on the road with a trailer connected to it. Because body on frame vehicles are much quieter inside the cabin when you're towing. The receiver, the ball, all of that, the trailer all connects to the frame in the vehicle and the body is what I'm sitting in as I'm driving it along. And the two things are isolated from one another. So as you're towing a trailer, this is gonna be an awful lot quieter inside than something like a Durango. You'll see the same sort of difference between the Durango and the Tahoe, the Durango and and the Expedition, etc. But one thing that is worth noting if I'm talking about trailer towing is that we don't find an integrated trailer brake controller in here, which I do think is a pity. And we will finally find one of those for 2019 in the Durango. When it comes to overall fuel economy, I'm going to give this model a D plus. We've been averaging about 14 miles per gallon. If you connect a trailer to this, you'll be down there around 12 or 13 miles per gallon. That's a pretty big difference between this and the 5.3 liter V8 in the Tahoe or the Ford Expedition. Even though the Expedition didn't quite live up to its lofty fuel economy goals, it will still be significantly more efficient than this. Remember that when we're talking about low fuel economy scores, the jump from 13 miles per gallon up to 15 or 16 miles per gallon in the Expedition is actually a pretty massive bump. And that accounts for an awful lot more fuel consumed, an awful lot more expense than making that same three or four mile per gallon jump if you're talking about a mid-sized sedan. So the overall cost, so the overall cost of operational the overall cost of operation difference between the Armada and the Sequoia at the lower end of the fuel economy spectrum. The overall interior finishes are definitely significantly better than we find in the Pathfinder and the overall experience behind the wheel definitely feels a little bit more premium than that Pathfinder as well. Although the basics of this vehicle are actually older than the Chevy Tahoe or the GMC Yukon, I have to say that aside from the infotainment system, the rest of this interior feels more modern as well, whether we're out on the road or whether we're just sitting in a parking lot. More impressive than that low sticker price is the laundry list of features that we get even in that base model, like navigation, LED headlamps, alloy wheels, adaptive cruise control with autonomous braking, front and rear parking sensors, and the Bose premium audio system. Now that model does come with cloth seats, so if you're interested in cloth seats, that's the model to get. If you want leather, then you just step one level up in the trim ladder. You'll notice that the four-wheel drive system is a pretty significant $3,000 bump over the base price. That's because it does include a two-speed transfer case. There aren't separate four-wheel drive systems here. We just have the one available. On the other side of things, if you want the fully loaded version that we were driving this week, you'll end up right around $66,000 for the four-wheel drive Platinum Reserve. Moving into the competition, obviously the 800-pound gorilla here is the Chevy Tahoe. Rumor mill tells us to expect a brand new Tahoe next year, so we may be seeing deep discounts on the Tahoe on dealer lots sometime in 2019. On the other hand, dealer discounts on the Armada are already very generous, so it's likely that the Armada is still going to be notably less expensive than the Tahoe, and it's going to give you that laundry list of standard features. Now, on the other hand, you aren't going to get Apple CarPlay or Android Auto at any price point in the Armada, and those are two really big omissions for me. 
In addition to that, even though the Tahoe is about to get replaced, it actually feels fresher on the inside than the Armada. Overall towing ability is not where we see the base version of the Nissan, but it is still fairly healthy. And if you upgrade to the more powerful engine in the Tahoe, then you can tow a pretty hefty amount. A little known quirk with the Tahoe is that there is actually a nine seat version available. You can actually get a three across bench seat up front, three across bench seat in the middle, and then three across bench seat in the way back. So if you're looking to seat nine folks outside of a full size van, this really is going to be one of the only options in America. The next very direct competitor is the recently redesigned Ford Expedition. Ford has gone all in on aluminum, all in on turbocharged engines, in a desire to try and make it the most efficient in this segment. And overall efficiency, especially on paper, is definitely excellent for the Expedition. Now, if you start driving the Expedition hard, or you start towing a lot, then overall fuel economy is definitely going to drop, but it's still going to be more efficient than the Nissan. On the other hand, it's also going to be more expensive. We haven't seen very many dealer discounts on the Expedition at this point in time. There are some, but they're not as generous as the competition. And the MSRP is definitely higher, starting over $52,000. On the inside, the Expedition is definitely more modern feeling than any of the other entries in this segment, quite logically, of course, because it is the newest. And of course, if you want the extra interior room, there is a stretched version of the Expedition available. We don't find a stretched version of the Armada. I didn't talk about the Suburban, but the Suburban would of course be the stretched version of the Tahoe. For some reason, GMC calls it the Yukon and the Yukon XL, but in the Chevy lineup, we have the Tahoe and then the Suburban. With that out of the way, let's move on to a blast from the past, the Toyota Sequoia. Yes, if you didn't know it, Toyota still actually makes the Sequoia, even though very little has changed for a very long time. Oddly enough, the Sequoia is more expensive than the Armada, which strikes me as funny due to its overall age and how little has actually changed on the inside. The major selling point for the Sequoia is, of course, Toyota reliability, but the major downside is overall fuel economy that hits a low of 13 miles per gallon in the city. The Sequoia is also probably the least fun to drive in this particular segment. Everything about the Sequoia just feels a generation behind. And that brings us right along to the Dodge Durango. Disclaimer here, I actually own a Durango for the very specific reason of towing ability. So not that long ago, I went through basically this exact same decision-making process, and I ended up with the Durango Citadel. The main reason for that is that at the same price as the base model of the Armada, you could get the V8 version of the Durango, which will tow 7,400 pounds, Usually that's good enough for most folks. Now, if you do need more towing capacity, you can go up to 8,700 pounds in the Durango. You can actually surpass the Armada. But if you don't need to go quite that high, you can stop at the 5.7 liter V8 in the Durango. And for about the same price as the base model of the Armada, get a ton more feature content in the Dodge. The Dodge is also going to be easier to park overall. It's going to handle better. It's going to be more fuel efficient as well. A lot of these benefits relate directly to the unibody design of the Durango versus the body-on-frame design that we see in the Expedition, the Tahoe, the Armada, the Sequoia, etc. Now there are some drawbacks to the unibody design as I talked about in this video. The main one is overall cabin noise when you're towing. So if you are regularly towing your boat or you're just using your vehicle as a daily tow vehicle where you have a trailer for work or something like that on the back, keep in mind the Durango is going to be louder in the cabin. The unibody, again, the trailer hitch is connected to the body and the frame. It's all one piece in a unibody vehicle. And when that receiver and the tow hitch are bopping around right there, all that sound is going to be transmitted directly into the cabin. So it's going to be quieter in a body on frame vehicle because the body and the frame are isolated from one another. But as far as actual towing ability, the Durango actually does a very good job here. We have a powerful V8 engine. The overall vehicle weighs less than many of these body on frame competitors. The overall vehicle is closer to the ground, even though we have relatively similar ground clearance, which gives us better on road driving dynamics. We also have independent rear suspension designs in the front and in the rear. That's a little bit different than many of these body on frame options as well. And of course, the big takeaway for me is by the time you've worked your way all the way up to the top end versions of the Armada or some of the competition, you could go the other direction and get a Dodge Durango SRT, which is going to be an awful lot more fun. It's going to be considerably faster than any of the other options out there. And oddly enough, we'll still actually tow more. Now on the downside, the Durango seats either six or seven, not seven or eight like the Nissan or even nine like the Chevy Tahoe. So if you need the seats and you need the towing ability, the Durango is not going to cut it. But if you just need the towing ability, then the Durango is actually going to be a pretty solid option. Bottom line, the Armada is unquestionably a good value if you're looking for a body on frame SUV. But my top pick in this particular segment would be the Durango if it fits your family lifestyle. 
Next up, we would have the Armada for its value, and then sideways from that, the Expedition for just its all-around character. But keep in mind, it is going to be more expensive. Now, I think that the Expedition is worth the extra dollar over the Armada, but again, the Armada is going to be a better value. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. Also find us over at facebook.com slash alexnado so you can see what we're driving this week. If you haven't already done so, hit that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen. And if you want to support this channel, click up there to the top of your screen. You'll be taken over to patreon.com. I'll see you later.